So I just want to say thank you to everybody for all the work everybody is doing. I recognize it. I see you and I really, really appreciate the advocacy. The advocacy that is happening for the students by every everybody here um, on the council. So I see you and I very much so appreciate your work, even those I can't see whose faces are on the screen. Thank you so much. And I will yield the floor to Paul. Thank you, Dan. Um, I appreciate that. Now, I just wanted to thank uh, thank you all for joining me today, my fellow students and friends. Um, I've been thinking about our role here in student government. Uh, it's involved considering where we've had successes and where we've also had our challenges and a reflection of my own shortcomings in the process. Um, I think we started off the year incredibly strong and took an enormous bite out of the pear, so to speak. Uh, there are parts I think that we still need to chew on. Uh, there is work that remains unfinished. We haven't completed the school supplies drive, ensured the funding of the Roadrunner food pantry, the swag purchase, the material items of either SCOTUS case condemnations of the Dobbs v. Jackson and Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta decisions that we had released. And there remains work to be done on elections, among other work we have yet to carry carry to conclusion. I think that we must remember that it is the students who cut our checks and it is the students we serve. Uh, in our roles here, we must advocate for them and provide them an elevated voice in this institution where often they don't have one. I am not an employee of this university, nor a member of the administrative faculty. I will not take work off the desks of administrative faculty in my capacity here in student government. We have talented people in our faculty to do that work. My work here is for the students and uh, you know, to support students properly, we must also support faculty. So that's not to say we shouldn't um, pay attention to them, but I wanna encourage everyone here to join me in investigating the problems students face on this campus, the inequities present, the ways our campus could be made more accessible, uh, obstacles we can help the university overcome. This investigation into the lives of our fellow students and the conditions of this campus should be what leads the conversation in this room. We must reorient our council towards finishing what we've started, building up a solid foundation for our student government and representing student interests at all tables of power we sit behind. I know we can all do this uh, because I've met you all and I've learned more about what drives you. Uh, I know you all care about the students and a better tomorrow, and I don't think any of this will be easy, uh, but I do know that if we work together, we can overcome many challenges and do good things for our fellow students and our community. Um, yeah, and that just concludes my my statement uh, on 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 all that. So I appreciate the time, and we'll, we can get into it. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda, if that's the right time to do so. Do so. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah, thank you for that, Mike. Uh, so on to the next part, approving of the agenda. Does everybody approve the agenda, or are there any amendments? Make a motion to amend the agenda. <clears throat> just a quick little discussion um, for it'd be item F. Um, a, com a combining of the events committee and the social media committee. That'd be after item E on new business. So we've heard a motion to combine the events committee and the social media committee into one. I'll second. Um, is there a second? All right, there's a second. Motion Secondary. on the floor is to combine. All right, we got a third. Motion on the floor is to combine these committees. Um, we'll motion move the into is discussion. Is anyone opposed? Oh, the motion before is just to add it to the agenda. I have not made that motion yet. Oh, well, due to our governing documents, you can make a motion at any time. And oh, so yeah, that's I just kind of how you amend the agenda. That's what oh, so you just want to amend the agenda to talk about that? Yeah, item F, okay. adding it to the end of our new business. All right, so lobby. That's all. Yeah, that's all I need at the moment. OK, and we'll just we'll talk about it at that point then. Is anybody opposed to adding this to the agenda? No, but I also have something to add to the agenda after. What do you have, Taylor? Um, I have a approval request for funding from the green purchasing agreement so it's a student org it's actually a greek life organization that is reaching out for funding to buy green purchasing materials all right so we'll put that as g anybody opposed to adding that hearing that okay no, so we I, have no oh i also have an amendment as well it's very uh, it's a very small matter um but if we could amend to just add it at the very end too after everybody's stuff so we're just asking if there's anyone opposed to the adding. So then we'll get on to the next amendment. But oh, okay, cool. is anyone opposed again to the adding of this particular item no. to discuss the green purchasing agreement? Oh well, the 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 purchase the the funding request from Student Org 
or green purchasing materials. Um, anyone opposed? Hearing none. All right. And we'll go ahead and adopt that as item as uh, item G, I guess, at that point. Um, all right, now, Naomi. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add something in a student literally like my last class just uh, brought to attention me getting possibly some uh, a new microwave, if not two, down in the science building uh, to replace the ones that they have because they don't work and that produces um, um, an issue for students to heat up their lunches um, okay. on campus. All right. Is anyone opposed to adding this item to the agenda? Hearing none. All right. And that'll be item H. Yeah. Okay. So now, is everybody opposed? Uh, so I guess, unless anyone's opposed, we'll adopt a new agenda. And move on to announcements, reports, updates. All righty. So this is just a quick report from the Governing Documents Committee. Um, we've continued our work on our governing documents on the mission statement. A lot of it's been done separate and outside of the committee. And so we got a lot of like individual pursuit of the completion of these tasks outside of the function of a committee. I would, I would say that we should all reflect on whether or not we need a committee to work on the governing documents if we're not, if we're not all sitting at the table talking about it. So um, I wanted to raise the kind of just the thought in people's minds and we discuss this as we go on of, of whether or not the governing documents committee is the tool we want to use to you know adopt change come up with governing documents because um, there's a need for some course correction in the work of the committee um, there's a lot of good work being done but none of it's done collectively it's all done as individuals we need to collaborate we're a team oh I you recognize a hand over here taylor um, I just had a point to make that um, to register as a student org that is due in 10 days. Registering as a student org for TSAC, it's due in 10 days. OK. That's I got you. Yeah. I, would, I would just ask that while we're like. Governing documents committee related, I do think that's important and I appreciate you raising it. Um, now, um, where was I? Just, um, so collectively, individually, we need to work together because as individuals, we're prone to errors or prone to making mistakes, the kind of mistakes that we one another can point out by including different perspectives on the creation of a document. Now, we've, we've ended up doing that with the Constitution that James is so wonderful to put together here. Like this is a great document. We're going to talk about it further on in the agenda. Um, item C of new business. Um, and that's in large part what the governing documents committee is, is is bringing to the table today is a presentation of that totally new constitution. It's solid. I've, I've looked at it, made a few changes um, that we've united on as a committee, and um, I look forward to, you know, hopefully passing it today. That's that's all we have respectfully. Thank you. Say cab. Stephanie, do you have anything? Then Mike. I'll go ahead and let Mike give the updates from today. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. Um, so today in SACAB, um, we actually brought in the police chief of Aurelia campus, um, Chief Michael Phibbs. Um, he came in and gave a presentation generally on um, the workings of the, of the police department we have here on campus. Um, a few key takeaways from this. Um, I was encouraged to see kind of the um, transition from policing and more into like a mental health resource kind of centers, putting some more money and some more energy into um, people who um, not police officers, people who are trained in mental health going out in um, into our community and helping people um, who might be struggling with that. So that was very, um, I did like hearing that from our conversation today. Um, do I have my notes in front of me? So I'm blanking on what else we talked about, but um, uh, I was encouraged by that conversation. Um, there's definitely more work to be done um, in terms of students interacting with the police. Um, Stephanie, go ahead if you can fill in some of my blanks. Yeah, um, another area of um, another area that the police department is looking to kind of address is their I forget the official name of it. I have it written down on my computer, but I don't have access right now. Is there it's kind of like their advisory committee. I forget the name, but they're looking for more members of the public to kind of fill on fill the positions available on that um, sort of committee for the police department. Um, so if anyone's interested or if you know of anyone who would be interested to sit on that, 
um, go ahead and either reach out to Mike and myself, Mike or myself, or um, we can get you in contact with their chief. Um, but yeah, that's all that I had in regards. Thank you. Yeah, that's generally what I have as well. Um, there's, there's probably some more other details that were missing, but um, that's generally big takeaways we thought from today's meeting. So, good work, both of you. Thank you, Gabe. Board trustee update. Hello, hi. I'm back. Awesome. So I'm louder than ever. You know, normal me. Um, so for the board of trustees, we had a retreat um two weeks ago, um, and so I learned a lot. Number one, so the first part of the tree dealed with like the cyber world of MSC Denver and how that will look like and stuff. A lot of it comes with like virtual reality and stuff. They had really like, like those fancy headsets, you know, that, that was fun. Um, but so their plan is to bring in, to, 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 trying to make MSC Denver more, more broader with just like cyber stuff. So like the, the, um, Metaverse of MSC Denver, and with and how that will look like right now is that there is going to be um, a pilot program launching for cybersecurity, in which um, there's this like course that you take and stuff. It's it's pricey. I I believe it was a a, a little bit over seven hundred dollars um, per course. You know that's something that um, me and the faculty trustees brought up of like how students going to pay for this type of thing. Um, but their plan is to not only market this to students but also to the surrounding community. Um, so that's like the first one that uh, they, they invested a, a $1 million into it and like everything. And so if you have any more questions about that, just like let me know and I can go further into detail. The second part is how do we make MC Denver the school of choice for students of color? Um, right now we have over 50% of our student population who identifies as a student of color. Um, and also with um, the faculty in student affairs is also more, uh, more than 50% um uh, staff or faculty of color um and so yeah and so ju ju just how how does that look and how do we envision that um to be broader more than just an hsi but more of an msi um and then also like how, how are we going to retain more black students because we only have a little bit over 1100 black students and that's the most in the entire state um, compared to other universities. The second is um, CU Denver with a little bit over 600. So yeah, it's it's bad. Um, so just how how are, are, are we retaining black students? How are we making MSU Denver a place for them to stay? And not just black students, but also faculty and staff um, who just are coming to MSU Denver um, and, they, and we're not able to retain them. And the question is why and what can be done to better that and better their experience? Um, and the third one was a lot of AHEC stuff um, and just like what's going on with AHEC. Um, but that that information is all over the place um, and wild. And so I'm not going to touch on that right now. But if you have any questions, just let me know. Um, yeah, that's like the big three things from that retreat. Thank you, Gabe. Naomi, you have a hand? About the board of trustees. Um, yeah, yeah. Am I allowed to ask questions at this part of the agenda? Did I forget. Is it about a board of trustees? Is it about the, the board of trustee update? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, Gabe. Um, I so I was wondering about the same thing because like I went for the um, uh, African American um, you know, uh, by that they got that section of the BIPOC community within the institutions because like the Native Indigenous students also um suffer that as well. So I was wondering, is, did anything get brought up? And if not, then I can help you with this. But like research on possibly implementing um, a system that has a, a mentor, a mentorship system, because other universities have this. And I've been studying this over the summer as well, um, that it's been proven to show that retention rates will get higher the more that there are the more mentorship programs that are involved in school that are more hands on and require those students to check in on a regular basis in order to keep them on track with their studies. So, and I did this research at San Diego State University. Um, I shouldn't say a lot of research, but I did that there. Um, and I spoke to them and I looked at the of an indigenous student mentorship program. And I brought this attention to Will Simpkins. So he knows that like we are aware of this, but I don't know if they have somebody who's particularly on it. And yeah, so if you want to collaborate with that, please reach out to me. And if so, I guess my question is, have you heard anybody going further with research on implementing those mentorship systems? 
Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Naomi, for your amazing question. Um, I so from what I heard, yes and no. So they're looking into like how can it be just like a better place, and what are we doing wrong type of thing, and what do we need to add that other schools have, um, that can benefit um all black students here. Um, and so for the question, they, they did mention like like the brother to brother program, um, and the sister circle program. I think that's what it's called. And, and how those are actually like helping to retain students and really showing how important those are and stuff. And so um, they are looking for like other ways to either expand on those um, or see like what other programs they could bring in um, in total. Yeah. Thank you both. Word. OK, thank you. All right. And, and just a reminder that we have a presentation at three. So um, uh, social media committee chat. The uh, social media committee did not meet this week, um, but I am starting to work on our offsite website uh, as well as um, I have some timelines now set for uh, when we'll have something recorded for the podcast um, as well as a uh, Jesus Christ, man, as well as a newsletter for the uh, the for us to send out to. Um, as well as a newsletter that can be sent out to all the students uh, and could go on live on that website. And then I am also working on uh, marketing material that can be handed out explaining how TSAC is different from a traditional student government. It can be handed out at events as well as live on our, on our new website as well. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and a comment on that, Chad. Um, I was just at a an advisory thing and, and something brought up to a student brought up to the higher ups about wanting to know more about the student government and all of that. And that was one of their issues. So that's good. That appreciate it. Bree, policy advisory committee, you have the floor. Thank you. We don't meet again until November 2nd, but I've gotten an email from Megan that shows the approval approved email policy and um, and shares also the proposes for the external funding policy that I've already shared with you guys. And then I think uh, there was a cabinet meeting um, yesterday that um, the COO spoke in Larry Sampler about the proposed animal policy, and I will forward that email to all of you. Thank you, Ree. Mm -hmm. The uh, CSGC, Mike. Hello, yes. Um, so um, there, we had a meeting, I believe it was Thursday, uh, I don't know, it was an hour Thursday. Um, I, I believe it was in set, I was in two meetings at once, so I was kind of glimpsing from both. Um, a lot of what we did was kind of get updates from schools. So um, there's about probably 10 institutions that attended that meeting out of probably the 25 in the coalition, I'd say. Um, so we talked just generally about how the schools are doing, um, what's going on. Um, what else we talked about? Um, we also talked about one thing, the, um, there was a representative from the Attorney General's office that wanted to talk a lot about kind of like, how to get like high paying internships for student government people um, to kind of work with the government, um, stuff like that. So we didn't really chat a whole lot about kind of um, schools at the moment, um, but we are meeting next month, I believe, to chat with, um, chat about it some more, so. Thank you, Mike. Mike, again, budget committee. Me, it's me again, oh, it is me again, my bad. So, um, Budget committee wise, I don't have any updates since last week. Last week we passed two packages, but that was in last week's recording. So I'm good there. So there's no updates in budget committee. We got those packages. Yes, they've, they've, they've arrived. arrived. Um, they were announced last week. Okay, go ahead. Um, How's the uh, the funding to the food pantry? Like what? Because I understood, or at least um, what I heard made me think that we were like um, receiving the training to ensure that that process had like been born out, but how's that looking? Where are we at? So um, this is also an advisory question that I might add, but it's just a simple um, transfer, I believe, of, of funds. We figure out the correct account to transfer it over to. Um, I forgot who it was, but we met with someone who um, talked about the accounts and stuff like that. So it shouldn't be too difficult just to transfer the funds over. Thank you, Mike. Oh, that was from both. Okay. Chad, is the uh, is the recording of that budget meeting made uh, available for the public so they know what we are spending our money on? 
Yes. How? The website, I believe. It's on there. It should be on the website. Yeah. That was not on the website. Mm -hmm. So if it is not if it is not available for immediate public consumption, we need to go over at least the amount that we spent and what it was spent on. Oh, in wow. an official public meeting, which is right now. Do you have your spread? If you're no referring idea. to the the food pantry money, that was already voted on by you all beforehand. So that's we, in the minutes. We also yeah. passed, uh, or the budget committee also passed packages for office supplies and other things, right? Those are voted on at the meetings as well. Okay, never mind. Purple. Yeah. I, didn't I go over that last week? I'm pretty sure I went over that no, last that week. That was like two, three weeks ago, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Take a look at that. Yeah, just to comment on what Chad was saying, though, I think that meeting good, with the, specifically the budget, like it's, it's not public. Let's start. Who has access to YouTube? You do, Chad? A good amount. Whoever. The social media committee does have Whoever access. Whoever does, I think after we do, after we record on Teams, let's just put everything on YouTube. That's what I think. All okay. committee meetings, you can make playlists and just keep it that way. That way it's easier to upload. For everybody. Beautiful. Sounds good. Paul. I do think we should. Um, you know, I, I just I'm not worried about um, anything that'll make us look bad or anything like that. But I do think we should review it for like like anything that would be we wouldn't want on the open web. Right. I don't know if there was if at any point during budget committee we talk about like sensitive like information. Um, which I don't know. I'm just going to throw that out there. It might be worth reviewing. No, anything no. that is spoken about in a meeting between multiple council members is considered public information and if y'all speak about sensitive information that is on the individual yeah i'm not trying to sweep anything under the rug or cover anything up here i'm just trying to like make sure someone doesn't get their identity stolen if uh, like a particularly like sensitive piece of information was said in some meeting that's more what i'm talking about but i just if you send me the file i'm happy to upload them awesome great okay um Faculty Student Affairs Committee, Bree, Naomi. We have not met again, but I just wanted to offer a reminder that anything that we would like faculty feedback about, we can go um, directly to this committee to get that from them instead of going around the world and back. And we have the chance to present to the Faculty Senate. So. Just let me know and I'll get you in touch with Barbara and we can get that set up if anything important is coming down the pike. Thank you. Thank you. Taylor, sustainability committee. Okay, wonderful. Um, so me and Alex, um, we're going to meet with ASCP today. Um, the one of the campus ad Ambassadors for Defend Our Future is going to come with us. That's what he said, but we'll see. Um, we also in Will Simpkins meeting today, um, I told him about the beehive idea. So CU Denver, they have two beehives and MSU Dustin has zero beehives. That is no beehives. That's an idea that we have is getting a beehive. Um, another one is just having MSU Denver follow um, ASDP suggestions and regulations. Mm -hmm. And Alex, did I miss anything? Um, I'm not I'm not sure. Um, I think that I think that pretty much covers it. Um, there was um, the meeting notes from our last week that I can include in this chat. Um, I'll have to find it um, or I can just forward it to all the council members via email. Um, and those the, the those were the notes from last week. And then I suppose it might be beneficial for us to do that same process with the notes that we have from this week. I like that. Thank you both for your work on that. That's awesome. All right, on to the events committee uh, with Stephanie. Um, or Taylor or Gabe, just giving everybody a space. I'll to go. Speak. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, so we had 
So Taylor is no longer part of the events committee anymore. Um, Chad, yesterday, yes, yeah, it was yesterday, yeah. Yesterday, um, so I was said, shared his interest in, in chairing the committee and stuff, and now, you know, combination. So, yeah, that's like all. So did you say that Chad is now the chair of the uh, events yeah. committee? He shared his interest in being oh, the chair okay. and stuff, right. but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you nominating yourself or are you nominating him? Oh, I think uh, we should wait to discuss on what happens with like, if we do merge it, I think we should wait to discuss more on that, on that front, you know, about who's going to chair that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Alan's not here, so the COVID... Alan, are you here? Okay, well, so then on to the next one there. Um, re, student travel committee, Re? Yes, well, um, we, are, we have no um, presentations this week, but next week there are three. So three students or groups are putting through presentations and I'll let you know what happens next week. Awesome, yep, have those on the calendar. All right. Um, Student Resource, our Indigenous Student Resource Committee. Naomi. You're cutting out. You're cutting out. We can't hear you. All right. Thank you. I can. I can maybe. All. So we had our first meeting um, Sunday before last, um, where. Yeah, I just got a little filled in on on uh, what the committee's been doing so far, and so the committee is now meeting, and I'm planning future meetings, and so, um, and uh, I, I wouldn't say any new updates um, from what we had discussed last week and what Naomi had talked about last week, but that's whatever update I can think of. Thank you. Okay, so the Alex, sorry, my apologies, sir. It's all right. Um, I do believe we meet uh, this Saturday as well. Saturday. For the Indigenous Resource. Is that? Yeah, I saw in the group chat that there was some some issue with uh, somebody being able to make that date. So that might be a little up in the air, but we are meeting on the weekend. And, you know, if you're interested in finding out when we're meeting, you know, get in contact with myself, Dan, Naomi. Uh, or Alex, and we can get you into the chat and, and uh, figure out when it is that works best for all of us, because there's a lot of moving parts in this committee. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. OK, so the president's cabinet I attended this month. It was yesterday. Um, I was able to read I request uh, some talking points that was prepared and some requests from some of us here, council members. Um, the two main points in the resolutions that got passed last week, uh, the president, President Davidson was responsive and said that that is something that they're actively looking at and working towards um, when it specifically comes to the federal holidays. Instead of doing, well, up until now, there was just a blanket federal holiday. They did what everybody else did without really doing anything investigative as to culturally appropriate things to be focused on or anything such as this. And that's no longer gonna be the, the, the modality in which they make these types of decisions regarding holidays. So they're gonna individually take various holidays starting with Indigenous Peoples Day is what I was told. Um, but it really was just kind of like, yeah, that's what we're working on. There's no fine dates, no actual plans, no, okay, we're going to do this, then this, then that. But we'll keep at it and and talking with some. I know uh, Will was receptive today, or excuse me, Dr. Simpkins was receptive today. Um, next was the housing. Also, the school is talking about housing. And, and for non-traditional students and those with families and different various potential avenues to addressing that um, as well as housing for um, you know other others um, students and you know different demographics um, then when it comes to the announcements of everybody else the the homecoming committee that did the homecoming last week I guess was very very successful or a couple of weeks back um next year is looking to team up with the student government for a homecoming parade which we don't have up until this point but it's something they want to um, look at so at some point will be reaching out to us to talk about that, although that would be a next year. Council thing um, ITS 
simulated a cyber attack. Um, simulated a cyber attack to the senior leaders, basically taking their computers hostage to showing the, the senior leaders what's possible and completely owned a lot of the different things in a simulated attack. So they can phishing attack, spear phishing, and they're kind of being educated on that, their cyber um, deal. Uh, let's see, oh, the university is implementing a new service animal policy. And so service animals are allowed. They're also gonna, there's certain, but there's five or five categories, but emotional support animals are allowed as well. And with certain accommodations through the Access Center for Students. So if you hear of any students needing to know anything about emotional support animals, that's through the um, the Access Center. And then there's also regulations, you know, the certain questions can't be asked if they're service animals and whatnot. Um, yeah, that's all I have from that. Next month is the last month, the last meeting for the President's Cabinet this uh, semester. Oh, Council Goals. Uh, Re, does anybody have any council goal updates? Although, actually, is our presenter here? Okay, should we table the? We should ask him where he's going. Are you? Uh, are you? Can you give us? Can you give us one second so we can do an advisor update, please? Yes, absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Armando. Well, I would ask. Can, is everybody okay with tabling the um, council goals updates till the end? Hearing none. Okay, Armando, go ahead with the advisor updates. Cool. Um, I have a few things. Student or carnival is postponed until the spring semester for week one. For the week of welcome to spring semester, just so you all know, that is not happening. It's going to be like two or three weeks. Um, I wanted to ask where we are at for food for finals because finals is coming up soon. I haven't heard anything at all about that. I need to start placing that catering order. We need to start setting up that event. So assuming everyone's just looking at me, shaking their head, I'm assuming no. So can we get that on for next week, please, to have a structured plan of action? Um, also, where are we at with the mission, vision, goals document? I see the constitution is done, and I see the goals documents been floating around with lightly two to three words per goal. But what I had mentioned before was a, a nice blurb for each goal so we can get that up and out. I just wanted to reiterate, and like I did in the last meeting, that we, in the very beginning of this year, had agreed to put the mission statement and the goals, the vision statement, into the work of the governing documents committee. And I just, I really do think that if we're going to just, if it's going to be a separate and different thing, and we're not going to follow through with what we united on as a council at the beginning of the year, we ought to dissolve the governing documents committee because it's not being used for the reason it was created. And so, um, but uh, otherwise, I think the work should be brought back in and we can collaborate on it. It's just not a separate thing and it wasn't when we started undertaking it, but it's become the separate thing. And I, I just think it flies in the well, face of what we agreed on. Not that it's a separate thing. It's that I've been asking for it for about a month and a half now. I've been asking for vision and goals every week for a couple months, right? At a governing document committee meetings. And so it's not, I understand your frustration. Mm -hmm. I share some of it. Um, I just... I, I do think that we ought to, you know, in order for democracy to function, the things that we agree on as a body here, we need to we need to carry them out. And if we decide to go in a different direction, we decide to do something differently, then we need to come together as a group and decide to do just that instead of um, just going in that direction without a collective voice on whether or not we're doing that. Sure. Uh, I can speak to the goals. Um, I can go in and make blurbs as far as like an actual goal statement a the goal is to do whatever uh, for the five goals that we agreed upon i am frustrated that the goal document has been added that people have added individual things that there are personal goals which we did not agree upon as a council um, so the first five goals that are in that document i can make a um, make a full statement for and then as far as the mission the vision it does. It falls on to the the governing documents uh, so, committee right now. So it sounds like all as the chair, you need to make a decision on when that will be finalized and yes, whether yeah. you have input or not. As the chair, be. yeah, like we need just to step up, do what you need to do, finalize it. When you come and we vote next next meeting, and we can move forward from there. Because so, I understand you've been waiting for everyone yes, else's input as well. Yes, you've been the only one there I, at most. Governing documents committee meetings anyway up until no the and I and I I've been recording understand. them and yes posting no, them and I understand and that so I, as you're leading that that 
that mission, just make the decision, come in, and everyone can vote as a council. Um, that is all for that. So if we can task that for next meeting to you come up with something, and then the, the council can vote on it. Um, next week, CMEI Brother to Brother is hosting an event with the Black Democratic Black Democratic Legislative Caucus at 3 p.m. on 10:26. Um, it'll be a panel discussion with uh, Black legislators in the caucus just to kind of promote uh, civic engagement and different things like that within the community. So if you know anyone, um, they are focusing on African American Black students, but um, anyone is welcome to attend. So that will be, I believe, in the garage. We are waiting for the final word on that. It was a kind of last minute event that was thrown upon us. But um, please, any and all are welcome to attend. And if you know any uh, black students who are interested in politics, they are looking for, damn, what is the term? Um, AIDS for the Black Legislative Democratic Caucus members. Legislative AIDS? Yes. Oh, cool. All so right. that is Good. definitely something we can talk about and push. Please spread and you can register to vote at that, att at that event. So right. that is all. Thank you. Yeah, please spread the word about that, folks. Okay. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Armando. All right. So, Angelica, you have the floor. Thank you awesome. for your patience. Of course. Yes, not a problem. Thank you so much for giving me the time um, to address um, the group here. It's been my first time this year, I think, that I've um, been to one of your meetings. So thank you so much for the time. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Angie Moreno. I'm the manager of assessment and evaluation for um, student affairs. And so I do sit um, in the vice president of student affairs uh, suite. Um, and I oversee a lot of different things from data management, data analysis, survey distribution and collection. Um, so just to give you an idea of my role on the campus. Um, but for today's conversation, I just wanted to share with you. Um, so earlier this semester, uh, Dr. Simpkins um, had decided that as a collective within student affairs, we really needed, needed to take the time to strategize and put together a plan that would guide our departments in the work that they do in the short term, so about three to five feet years, and then also in the long term to 2030 that aligns with the university strategic plan. And so um, I wanted to share with you all today what that process looks like and also um, put a call out for for any within um, TSAC or any other student um, that is listening or that you have access to to participate in that process. And so um, there are it is a year long process for us to create a strategic plan for student affairs. Um, this fall will be engaging in three phases. Currently in October, I am doing some internal work to meet with our staff within student affairs to just get some really high level like understanding like why does student affairs exist at MSU Denver? What is our purpose? Uh, what is our role on this campus and who do we want to be um, in the future, right? So kind of really take, having some really informal discussions. We're calling them visioning statements, uh, excuse me, visioning sessions. Um, and there's small group, like 15 people at the most conversations um, that I'll be hosting throughout the month of October. In November, then I'll be putting together uh, times, dates and times for people to join in as stakeholder groups um, to do a SWOT analysis of student affairs. So to analyze our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities and threats um, that would help to guide us again to get to those strategic goals for student affairs. And so this is where I, I would welcome the input of students. Um, I'll be putting together and I'll, I'll also really appreciate your um, uh, your guidance as to like a time and a date, whether it should be virtual or not or in person. I'm totally open and flexible into providing different dates and times for students to come together to do a SWOT analysis of student affairs, um, and that will take place in November. I'm also doing um, focus groups with faculty, with um, community groups, with employers, with um, different groups of student affairs staff, um, and then also staff outside of student affairs, faculty senate, staff senate, really want to make sure that this is an inclusive process, that we're collecting um, enough feedback and voice to guide um, who we want to be in student affairs. And so that's in November. 
In December, I'll then compile all of the information collected in the first two phases and bring it back to Dr. Simpkins and our leadership team, which is our two associate vice presidents that oversee student engagement and wellness and the classroom to career hub and our chief enrollment officer that oversees our enrollment management area. So together we will then make some meaning out of the data that we've collected, that I've collected, um, and start to put together those high level um, strategic goals um, that will then guide our work into the spring semester where we'll be a lot more intentional about like this is these are the actions that need to happen these are the metrics that we'll be tracking to get us to these goals and move forward sorry my cat is just growling right over there so if you all hear that <laughs> enjoy for now <laughs> um, let's see I'm going to pause because I feel like that was a lot of information but do are there any questions right now yes yes please Yes, uh, somebody in the chat wrote, is this work happening now or is this work for the next year? It is now. So currently this October, I'm, I'm doing that internal work with our groups. And then in November is when I'll be doing uh, focus groups uh, in a guided SWOT analysis. I guess my question is, I, I hear a lot about like student voice and um, and this being like a like almost like a like a feedback gathering process. Um, is is that the extent to which um, we students would be able to impact the strategic plan is via just our feedback? Well, what else were you thinking? I right now that's that's the starting point, but I I honestly am open to a lot of different ideas and however you would like to. But yeah, how, what were you thinking? Oh, I'm just thinking more generally, like because I I just I I think that um, you know if we for example, like the university policy on um, oh, student affairs. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I need to like scale down the scope of my question a little bit. Um, yeah, I didn't have anything in particular in mind. Although, um, yeah, I guess question as interpreted. I don't have any uh, particular examples. Sorry. Oh no, no, it's that's a little okay. too abstract. <laughs> Um, if it becomes clearer, please let me know. I I will let you know that currently in these October sessions, so I mentioned these are visioning sessions with our internal staff. So this is staff that is anywhere from admissions to registrar um, to career engagement, uh, CMEI. Gosh, we're, there's a lot of us within student affairs specifically. And so the guiding assumptions of these conversations is that students are at the center of the work that we do, right? Everything that we do is student centered, student focused, focus on the success of students, because why would admissions exist other than to bring students into our campus and make sure that they are successful on our campus, right? Why would CMEI exist if not to engage students in purposeful dialogue and purposeful involvement to do some professional development, individual development um, as you engage in campus. And so this is really focusing on the co-curricular, extracurricular aspects of a student journey on this campus. And it is centered in, in a student's identity. Um, I hope that that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, that kind of helps me a little bit. Um, I guess I I think of the, the faculty senate having um, and I just I only have like broad strokes here, but having like voiced input on particular like, you know, administrative faculty conversations wherein like real valid, um, you know, course correction and or um, suggestions were um, brushed, brushed aside as as uh, feedback that could be ignored. Mm. Right. And mm. I just wanted to think that if we as students are participate in this progress in this um, in this process and like really bring about some 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 good suggestions that they would be like very like seriously considered and a part of the, the, the process in forming the strategic plan. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Now I hear you there. And actually, when I, I joined the group uh, a little bit earlier than my time, and so I did hear a little bit of a conversation about um, focusing on mentoring and mentoring relationships. And I know that's definitely something within student affairs that we've been thinking about how do we provide more of those wraparound services for our students so that they do get the guided support that they need, right? Not just that any student needs, but that one specific student might need a one-on-one -on -one mentorship with either a peer or a faculty member or a staff member. Um, and the intent then within this strategic planning process is that 
you know, there's so much going on on this campus and resources, at least within our units, is is minimal. And so we do what we can. And so hoping that there are some themes like this wraparound support for students that are then brought to the forefront that we can say, you know what, with these resources that are limited, we want to focus it on this because this is what we're hearing. This is what majority of our students are saying that they need. This is the majority of our staff saying that they know their students need. So we can be a lot more intentional to say if an idea pops up over here somewhere to say, how does that align with our strategic plan to support students? And if it does and if it doesn't, then we can really um, monitor and or align our efforts to to a common goal. Um, right now, I feel like it's kind of like we should try this and we should try this because we heard this might work and this might work, but we don't have the data right now to really say whether or not those programs are truly effective and impactful. But if we can then do some targeted and intentional strat strategic um, goals, we can then align these metrics to say, OK, for the next two years, we're really going to track the effectiveness of this plan or this program or this service to see if it's effective. And if in two years it comes to the down to like this is not effective, but this is, then we can move resources and align goals in, in a different way. Um, but we just we really want to be a bit more strategic in, in in supporting your experience outside of the classroom. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just to touch on the mentorship piece, I've heard that thrown around in a couple of different um, circles around the university recently, as that would be something that's very helpful, especially there's a um, there's a population of students that I know are just starting or the university still just starting to, you know, really kind of hone in on is the justice impacted justice mm -hmm. system impacted students. And there's an initiative starting up and um, that mentorship was very important to that to, to those students as well. Um, so I, I really um, like to hear that now. So is the student affairs and oversees all the enrollment services like um, admissions, registrars and all of that? Yeah, admissions, yep. oh. registrar, financial aid, orientation transfer. Um, so does the um, strategic plan going to also focus on kind of like the. The siloing of those different offices to make it more of a cohesive flow for students to come in and kind of be guided through the process of emissions and all that a lot more a lot, lot yeah. more easy. All right, cool. I definitely think that's probably going to end up becoming a common theme throughout. So right now I'm just collecting those those yeah. thoughts and ideas and um, but I have heard that there's been some siloing in, in those areas and a one stop shop or a, um, even just improving access and information via our website would be so beneficial to students because the thing you find it right there, right? How do we how do we lean into a a, a better and more effective digital presence in those areas, I think is like a one good way to start. And then also, again, like aligning, have you said, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for uh, Chad? Yeah, so, um, so far it feels like the conversation is leaning more towards strategies and tactics rather than the, the SWOT that you're, you're wanting to like reference and uh, speak about. Uh, if the SWAT is like the end goal, I think um, targeting students that have a really good understanding of what a SWAT is, because like it took me a long time to learn what it is through my studies, like the business, marketing, and public relations students. Um, I think that they can definitely like help um, get a good idea and good understanding of what the um, the actual strengths, weakness, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are, and then for the community building aspect of it. Um, kind of gear more towards the strategy strategies and tactics that will help uh, get towards the objectives and goals. Um, so the majority of students can definitely provide those strategies and tactics. Yeah, yeah, I think so part of the, the focus groups, it will be a learning curve is understanding like this is what the process is. So um, I, I definitely value your your input as to like finding students that know what the, how this process functions, but I also want to make sure that students um, can find their place in those conversations, and I'll be able to do that by like providing like okay this is this is how we will function this is what a SWOT analysis is, um, and then offering up those really pointed and guided questions to make sure that we're getting at the information that we need for that for that process. But yeah, thank you for that. 
Um, I, I would love your guidance as far as, so right now I've offered up, um, I mentioned I'm doing this with a lot of different stakeholders in the month of November is when, when I'll be doing the SWOT analysis. I know that's also like, there's a break in between there and we're coming up on finals. Um, so it's, it's not an ideal time of the semester. Um, in working with faculty, I've offered them up two sessions that they can join in, one in person, or actually both are online. Um, so I'll be doing those virtual. Um, and so I, I would love your guidance or input as to a good time for students. I My schedule is flexible, so if it needs to be earlier in the day, if it needs to be later in the day, if it needs to be on a weekend, I I am up for anything as long as I know it'll work for our, for our students and would love your guidance on that. We appreciate your dedication. We thank you so much. So are you asking for that right now? Like is asking to us to come up with the time of day or are you like any suggestions or is it where you saying you're done and you're just going to reach out in the future? Sorry. I yeah, sorry about that. If you have any suggestions now, I'd gladly take them. If you need some time to kind of think about it or reach out to some other students um, that you serve, then please take the time or maybe in the next week or so, if I could um, maybe get a response to that, that would be great. Okay, yeah, right off hand, I, uh, I'm flexible, Barry, and I work way late into the night and early in the morning, so I'm not really a good one to, you know, to, to speak on that, but I guess that's something we can come up with over the next week, and if you want to you have my email right and, and we can if you touch base the via there and I'll reach out to remind the counselors and then reach out to any students I know and I'll encourage them to do is the same. So thank you so much, Angie. Of course, you're welcome. And this was Dan. Is that this is Dan. Yeah, it's okay. Dan. All right, perfect. Wait. Yes, I will right. circle back with you. All right, thank you so much. Let's give it thank up for you. Angie. Thanks, Angie. Thank you all. Thank you, Angie. Thanks for taking the time. All right. Gabe. Gabe has the floor. Are you throwing the Kenny, you got it? Will you get it when he gets it? There it goes. I can do it too, but wait, you're taking notes. I'll do it. I can do it for you, Kenny. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kenny. I have to stand because I don't like pretending sitting down. Okay, hello everybody. Hi, hope y'all doing great. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to y'all about this ask and this presentation that I made. You know, this ask and a presentation. And it's about DACA. So what is DACA? You know, I'm pretty sure y'all probably have heard about it somewhere in the news, you know, saw a headline about it. Some of y'all might know what it is. Some of y'all might have an idea. Well, DACA, also known as Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was created by Obama in 2012 uh, to create protection from deportation for undocumented youth who came to the country um, when they were young and, and were brought here either by their parents or by somebody else. Um, it also brings work authorization so they can contribute um, and be able to get jobs and stuff in almost any sector. Um, and they're able to also travel outside the U.S. with advanced parole under certain conditions like um, education, family emergencies, etc. So DACA stats nationwide. There are around 700,000 taxpaying dreamers all over the nation. And these taxes are, are about $9.5 billion in federal, state, and local taxes. And these contribute to Social Security and Medicare that, undocu that DACA, uh, that DREAMers cannot receive. So, you know, it's all contributing to the citizens who are able to access that, but DREAMers can't, but they're still, you know, contributing to it. Um, and 74% of Americans support permanent legal status for DREAMers. So just keep that in mind, Penny. Awesome, so DACA stats in Colorado. 14,000 current DACA recipients, there are four, at least 14,000 current DACA recipients here in Colorado as of now. Um, and they contribute to around 6.1 billion to 
uh, Colorado's annual, annual GDP. And around 3.8 of the population here is undocumented. And between Denver and Lakewood combined, it's the 17th largest population of undocumented immigrants in the nation. And Daxata and MC Denver, we, as of spring 2021, there are 496 Dreamer undocumented or DACA students here at MSU Denver. And with that, we serve around 45% of all ASSET students here in the state. ASSET is a bill that was brought in um, to, to allow um, immigrants to access in-state tuition. Um, yeah. And so what's going on, right? What's going on with DACA? Why is it popping up on y'all's headlines? Why is it everywhere? You know, what, what's going on? Well, DACA is in danger. DACA right now is, right now there's a path for DACA to be shut down and for millions of people and for thousands of people's lives to be impacted, for families to be impacted, for the nation to be impacted, um, for the economy to be impacted, impact all around, not just to the community, but to everyone. Um, and so it all began with the Trump era trying to take it down and being like, no, nah, we don't want DACA, you know, they were like, no, nah, this is bad. Um, and then the Supreme Court ruled that no, that the way they're trying to take it down was based on the, on the basis of, of, of what they said was wrong with it. They were like, no, that doesn't work. So now it went back and applications were being open again and everything. But then, but then. A Texas District Court judge said no. He decided to put the pause on the program again and be like, no, you know, let's re-examine this program and stuff. Um, and so right now there's no applications that can be accepted, but current DACA recipients can still renew and apply for advanced parole. Um, yeah, and so now what's going on, right? And so all that decision was sent to the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals to see if if DACA was lawful. And they decided with a couple of weeks ago. Hello? Oh, okay, cool. Sorry. So yeah, so the fifth US Circuit Court of Appeals sided with the Texas District Court ruling that DACA was unlawful. You know, and that's that's like very sad and terrifying. And so then it went back to the lower courts um, to see if Biden's new proposal with DACA and stuff was unlawful or not. And I believe that the Texas District Court ruling, again, once ruled that it was unlawful. And so this creates a path for DACA to be completely demolished. Um, and Biden, he when he came in, one of his big things was like, oh, immigration reform. Sadly, there, we haven't seen nothing. You know, it's, it's bad, you know? Uh, disappointed, very. Um, yeah, and so now what else is going on? Applications cannot be processed. And so there's 100,000 high school graduates each year who cannot apply for DACA and bring in their skills and their expertise and everything into the workforce, you know, including me. I can't. I, I'm one of the people whose application is still in limbo because of the Texas District Court ruling. Awesome. And so where do I get this information from? Immigrant Services Program, um, more specifically the Undocu Peers Committee, which I'm on and stuff, and we, and we do like trainings um, on on everything undocumented and documented and Dreamer student related. Um, we I also got a lot from the Colorado People's Alliance, which they focus on immigrant justice as well and other things, and Forward.us, which is also run by one of our trustees, Marissa Molina. Awesome. And so, what's the ask? You know, why why am I here? You know, why am I standing up here? Well, I think that MSU Denver student government, the Student Advocacy Council, we need to do something in some way, shape or form to help influence what's going on. You know, so the trustees during my retreat, that they have released a letter now with this condemning the decision of the Fifth Circuit Court and the faculty trustee is also um, working with the faculty senate to see what else can be, what, what, what can come from their end. And President Davidson also, uh, in conjunction with a, with a lot of other universities, released a statement saying that they condemn um, the court decision that was made. And so then I was like, you know, we should also do something similar. Why? Because as you saw, we serve the most 
Dreamer, DACA, undocumented students in the entire state, you know? And so as student representatives, we're here to represent them as well and their voice and be their voice and be here to advocate on their rights, you know? Um, and so let me pull up the other document, please. And so I drafted a letter um, that I hope the rest of y'all are like, okay, you know, hopefully I plan to motion on this letter so it gets passed and then hopefully this letter will be sent to our legislators, um, to our senators, to our representatives, to anyone who has any power to make a change in this permanently. And so I'm going to read the letter. Yeah, because why not? So we, the student government, the Student Advocacy Council of MSC Denver, condemned the fifth U.S. Cir Circuit Court of Appeals decision in the state of Texas versus the United States, which agreed with the district court ruling that DACA or deferred action for childhood arrivals is unlawful. We call on our congressional representatives to push for legislation. I like lost my place. There we go. Immediately, that helps permanently resolve the status of dreamers. We stand with our dreamer, DACA, undocumented students, faculty, staff, and their families whose life is impacted by this decision, whose future is in limbo. Ending DACA will have negative impacts all over the nation. Since DACA recipients annually contribute over $9 billion in federal, state, and local taxes, along with a contribution to Medicare and Social Security, the removal of the program would be a disastrous for the U.S. economy. Just in our state of Colorado, $6.1 billion will be reduced in the state's annual GDP if the program is removed. The nation's labor force will also be greatly impacted by the program ending. Many businesses will lose employees, schools, hospitals, clinics, and so many more will lose valuable employees in a time where many are short staffed. If the program ends, it will, the impacts will be felt and seen. While the program remains in limbo, thousands of undocumented youth are not able to apply for the program. This year alone, around 100,000 undocumented youth will graduate from U.S. high schools without being able to apply to the program. Their talents and skills that could help the nation's economy and society overall are not able to be accessed. We have also seen how DACA has reduced the gap of attendance and graduation between citizen and immigrant students by 40% in high schools. In other words, this program creates opportunities and benefits not for everyone, not just undocumented DACA or Dreamer individuals. Congress needs to act now to legalize the presence of undocumented DACA Dreamers and give them a path to citizenship through legislation. We call on our senators and representatives to act for the sake of not just the undocumented DACA Dreamers, but for our country and our economy. And so that's my ask that whoever want, hopefully us as the, you know, Unity, student leaders, student representatives, we can help and start sending these letters, you know, start sending them. Whoever wants to sign it can sign it in something that's just endorsed by the MSU Denver SGTSAC. Any questions, comments, or concerns? That was awesome. I have a comment. I, um, I really um, am glad that we're taking this up and that you uh, took initiative on writing this, Gabe. I, I wish I could reciprocate the energy that you just following you is hard <laughs> after, after that presentation. Um, but I want to stand with you on that and definitely add my name uh, to the people signed on to this letter and my support that we, we send this out as a council. And it, even if um, it doesn't enjoy popular support. I will make a revised version of my own to send to my representatives personally, because um, I think this is fundamentally important. You were talking about like Coloradans, like our fellow Coloradans, our fellow students who are treated um, like second class citizens or relegated to the second class citizenship or cut into two groups, legal and illegal, as though a human being can be illegal and they cannot be. It's just not a thing. Um, and so, I, I, I think that this is like, um, you know, it's, it, it is an excellent first step and we should lean into this work even more, I think, after it. So, Thank you, Paul. And I, and I believe that like within our goals isn't like immigration one of the goals, you know, so this will really align with like our goals, you know, our goals. Awesome. 
Um, and then also, furthermore, I plan, if this letter does get approved, hopefully, you know, and stuff, um, to expand this, reach out to other university student governments and make this kind of just a fight that we can all help. Yeah, thank you, Gabe. Yeah, I think it would definitely align into the uh, our focus on immigrant immigrant services. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gabe. Good work. Thank you. And so with that. Oh, you're off. You're, you're, okay. It's off. Just to make sure. There we go. Thank you. And so with that, I motion that this council endorses this letter and participates in sending it off uh, to our congressional representatives. Um, and yeah. Heard. Is there a second? Second. Heard. Nice. All right. All right. Got a third. Um, so. Most move to uh, move to question on. Us signing on to this letter and. And, and, huh? and further discussion. All right, so on to vote. Well, I was just going to say, is anyone opposed to us signing on to this? We'll start with the opposition. And if there is none, further comment. And then if not, move to vote. Anybody calling first the opposition? All right, nobody? Anybody else want to speak on this? All right. Oh, sure. Please. Yeah, OK, and, then, and like I said, you know, depending on how this goes, um, my plan is to like have as many of you who want to sign it, sign it because I think there's more strength in numbers. Um, yeah. Now you know. I, yeah, yeah. I encourage everybody here to call the question to sign to say it on to it. All right, Alex. Aye. Chad. Aye. Gabe. Aye. James. Aye. Mike. Aye. Naomi. Okay. Uh, uh, Paul. Aye. Bree. Aye. Stephanie. Yes, 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 and yes. Thank you. Taylor. Yes. And I from me. And then Naomi, are you there? Yes, she voted yes. All right, unanimously. Thank you, Council. The motion was res uh, unanimously passed. Thank you. Next up. Uh, Next item of business of section four, subsection C, James, you have the floor for the introduction of the constitution that was drafted. Thank you. Hey everybody, so I have finally drafted a constitution for us. Um, a lot of people have asked me kind of why I did it on my own. It was not to undermine the council in any shape or form. I just happen to work better and faster when I am just kind of in my own zone. So what I did was I started off just most of what's in here has been, you know, from experience, from our communal document, our handbook, and from our meetings, just learning how everyone wants our government to work. So while, yes, I was the one who put in a lot of work into it, it wasn't my own ideas. It was from everybody in this room who, you know, just through my experiences. And as of last week, I introduced the draft version so all of us can take time to, you know, look over it, give me some new ideas, um, add some things, delete some things. Um, I'm happy a lot of people have been, you know, giving me some more uh, stuff to put in here. This has definitely changed from last week. Um, so I really hope that we can pass this unanimously because I do believe that in order for this to really be our governing document from here on forward, it needs to be something we all agree on. And I just want to note that there are things in here I understand not everyone will like. There are things in here that we wish to change in the future, and it is a constitution, so it can be changed. It is not set in stone. You don't have to like plead to God to fix it. Like we can have discussions down the road if you're not happy with something right now. Um, but just so you know, like this is a democracy and I want you guys to all have a voice in this. We have a motion to mm -hmm. I have a. Oh, actually, see Gabe. Um, before we do that, before we do that, can we just like talk about it just like a little bit, you know, could it just some things? You know, like the chair, because right here it says one chair. And so that is like 
it might not seem like a big thing, you know, but like if one person's doing like all like all the stuff. Yes. Can I? Yeah. Let me speak on that real quick. So this is actually something that Paul has been wanting to introduce for a couple of weeks. He will be able to clarify it more uh, than what the actual document says. So Paul, do you want to go ahead and take over? Yeah, and I just want to reassert uh, stack and let's just make sure everyone's getting a voice and that we're like following a structure that'll pers like pursue a completion of this business item. Um, the reason why I have suggested that we consolidate the co-chair positions is I'm I'm reminded of the movie Pacific Rim. You know, you have two Jaeger pilots driving the robot when really it would operate a lot better if you had one. Um, I'm not trying to do some sort of power grab or anything like that. Heck, part of this is my intent to um, step down to what could be the reduced role of vice chair. And we're not talking about like any sort of, um, you know, uh, increased workload on, on, on Dan or anything like that. Heck, the workload's been reduced, right? We have a secretary working on the agendas now. We have, I mean, I know Dan uh, has had some other uh, schedule adjustments that has uh, freed up the workload a bit. And not to say that the vice chair wouldn't be able to help I just really think that there are times, and even at the beginning of this meeting where we're like, you know, who we, now you, now me, now you, now me, when really the facilitation of a meeting would be best best, best done with a single individual. Um, and I don't know, Dan, if you could speak to any, I mean, it hasn't been so frustrating that I can't work with you, but I do know it impacts the efficiency of our work a little bit. Can you speak to that or your half of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think overall, um, the experience thus has been is that the I guess it, the roles or responsibilities that each person, you know, a co-chair is like, are we both going to do this? Or And so essentially one's going to have to take the lead a tad bit on the work. And so then it would make sense to be a vice chair. Um, yeah, I think the executive assistant has lightened the load a tad bit, but I do think that in the meetings and in, in certain things like this, where we're, where we're both trying to juggle or two people are juggling the, the, the directing of the meeting and interrupting and kind of is a little bit more jam, um, more clunky than it needs to be, but that's been my experience uh, thus far. Does anybody else, Taylor, please? Um, I understand what you're saying. I do. Um, but in my perspective, going to a system where there's a chair, a vice chair, then the rest of the council, that begins to look more like a hierarchy. And that's kind of what we got rid of when going towards shared governance. Mike. So um, this is just a suggestion I have because we've been going over say cabs governing documents with an actual like lawyer. Um, it's probably better, I'd say, just to keep this ambiguous. I mean, I have zero interest. I mean, I don't really care if we have a chair or a co-chair. I don't I don't think it makes a difference. I don't think it makes um, I don't think there's I think there's hierarchy in both. It, to be honest, like I think there's co-chairs or there's even just hierarchy in that motion in general. Um, but I just think if we keep it kind of just ambiguous, just a chair, you can choose each person who wins the election can choose that um, each election, then I don't think it matters too much to my to cost. Thank you, um, Mike. A Alex, do you have something? Yeah, I I, um, I would kind of like to, to speak on what uh, Mike and Taylor had said earlier. Uh, I think a huge part about the um, um, sorry, the, the, the like the responsibilities and then the I guess the power or authority that comes with a hierarchical structure. Um, to me, that would be like the responsibilities of the chair and the co-chair. Um, and you know, may, maybe we could vote on this now and then define what those very specific responsibilities are. Um, if not already fully laid out here or in other documents. Steph Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think a lot of my um, hesitation does come with the whole power structure thing. Um, I know that it's hard to work with a co-chair and we honestly came up with that idea kind of out of like while we were sitting at a table in the office last year um, because we were just trying to make something work. Um, it's not the best. I don't think it works as effectively as it could. And I do think that one person kind of holding like a president or vice president role 
works a lot more smoothly, but I think it works a little bit more smoothly because we understand it a little bit more. Um, and so I really just want to try and urge us to kind of think creatively about these positions and see if there's another way that we can really just get rid of this whole um, hierarchy thinking because the whole point of TSAC was to dissolve that. Um, and I feel like kind of going with what works best or what we know best leads us back into kind of what SGA was before TSAC came around, um, which is fine if that's what you feel is what you want, but that isn't what TSAC is. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my only hesitation with this whole thing, but I really appreciate your work and um, getting this out there and kind of just getting it done, James. I really do value that, but that would be my only area of concern. So James, then Taylor. So one thing that I'm noticing about from this is a lot of people are concerned about power. However, the full statement says the chair will share in the equal and fair distribution of power given to all other members of the council. This in no way is giving the chair, if we consolidate down to one, extra power. If anything, it's just giving them more responsibilities, such as attending more meetings by themselves instead of it having to where one month Dan goes to the president cabinet meeting and the other month Paul goes. Realistically, it's just more responsibilities. So my only fear is the one person may get burnt out from it all. I'm not so concerned that they're going to take all the power because in this constitution, we clearly state they don't have more power than anyone on this council. So as far as power, I'm not concerned about that. Being burnt out, that is where I am. I'm a little nervous about, but. Thanks, James Taylor. Um, yeah, I just I really do want to reiterate that this um, constitution, I really like it. It's an improvement, I would say, to the communal document. It's more accessible for people who want to participate. They can understand what we are, what we do. Um, another thing that I. I don't want to say I don't like because <laughs> I don't want to trash on it because it, it's really good. Um, I. I'm not a fan of saying that in Article 2, Section 1, where we say that these meetings will follow Robert's rules of order. I think Robert's rules, while they work great for us, I don't think we should be mandating them. Paul and Stephanie. So I, I think I agree to a, an extent with the Robert's rules bit there, because I, I, I do think that it is useful to structure our meetings and would be useful in the event of you know, like someone who wanted to totally upend our meetings, Robert's rules could be like a, a, a safeguard to a certain extent. So I think workshopping how we can use it to help us and not hurt us necessarily. You know, if you look at the picture of the guy and uh, it's so small, no one's going to be able to see it, but he looks like this old white general from the Civil War. And I can understand that wanting to follow all his rules, um, at least in terms of it um, being a constricting effort. I, and I do also share with this um, this, this, uh, this, this, this talk about hierarchy, although there's elements that I stray from a bit, it's like hierarchy should be justified and we should, as students, you know, engaged in the, you know, the, the production point of ideas reflect on and critically reflect on the values that our society holds so that we do, um, question hierarchies and find out, is this justified? Is it not? But I do think there, there exists a justified hierarchy in, having a person run it, like facilitate a meeting so that it might be ordered and like go from item to item to item and ensure that everybody has ample opportunity to speak and that the minority voice is protected um, against, you know, the majority and all these other things that we can only really do if we have some sort of organizational order. And that doesn't have to turn into the SGA. And I definitely think that, you know, when I made my revisions to this document, I was, I kept that in mind. I'm like, wow, they did a lot to try and dismantle. It was a, like a very hierarchical government with a president, a vice president and a treasurer and people who are getting paid more than other people. This document, if you read it, outlines a very specific division of power that James was speaking to that accepting the aforementioned power, the power to facilitate and maintain parliamentary order, the chair will share an equal and fair distribution of power. To say that our government has no hierarchy would simply be untrue. And I and I think that to abolish hierarchy, we would have to have no facilitator in a meeting. 
and I would question what such a meeting would would look like, what form it would take, and if it would best accomplish the, the ends that we want to reach here in student government. And so I, I want to say, let's walk that line on on uh, you know questioning hierarchy. Is this hierarchy justified? Is this power imbalance justified? Is the ability to run a meeting a, a justified power imbalance? I think so. Um, but I do think that we should be mindful of it and honestly recognize it in our documents if we were to keep it in check. Because otherwise, we say there's no hierarchy, there's a little bit of hierarchy. What else develops that's outside of alignment with what our documents say? Um, even if it's just the littlest hierarchy, council, 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 chair, council, 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 even if that little bump is just, you know, somebody running a meeting, right? It is a privilege that ought to be recognized because if we don't and we just pretend we all hold the same amount of power in this room, well, Dan and I actually are like, you speak and you speak. If we don't recognize that that's a power that somebody has, like hierarchically, um, then how are we to keep it in check? How are we to question it if it goes out of bounds or something? Um, and so the spirit of like, let's be careful, I stand with entirely. But I also think that there is hierarchy, um, but justify it. In the name of progressive staff, we're going to do Alex and then Stephanie. Um, thank you. So I, I appreciate what, um, what Paul, you just said. I think that it's, that's really insightful. Uh, concerning the current structure that we do have. Um, so mostly what I wanted to add was on the Roberts Rules of Order specifically. If we don't want to utilize the entire like book of Roberts Rules of Orders, but instead choose the the rules that work for us um, and then specifically state them, you know, within this document or another document. Um, I'm, uh, and so I'm just kind of wondering what people might think about doing that. Can I have a direct response? Sure. To that? Yes. I have a copy of Robert's rules in front of me. It's like 600 pages. And I believe that would be such a grand undertaking that it would, we are much better off. There's another way of going about that that does not involve reading this whole book. Um, and I, we, I mean, we have members who haven't read the governing documents. How are we going to, how am I going to get somebody to read 600 pages of Robert's rules? Let's be real. All right, and I noticed, uh, Stephanie, you had your hand up. I'm sorry to cut you off. I didn't mean to jump ahead there. Stephanie? Um, yeah, so I do appreciate you um, kind of recognizing, no, not kind of, recognizing the existing um, positions of power that exist within our current structure. But I also do want to recognize that TSAC was created to actively kind of, like how I had mentioned earlier, think creatively on how to get better at dismantling that. And so I think that's what I was trying to mention with my first comment is not to just say that what we have is perfect or that what we have doesn't imply any kind of positions of power, but that we were trying to just work on actively dismantling it. And so, and also to um, comment on James's comment to mine earlier, um, I think that's kind of my area of concern is that that specific person would be assuming more responsibility than needed. That isn't, I guess, from my point of view, I don't think that has to be necessary. And I think that that can be shared amongst everyone. It doesn't have to be like one chairperson that has to attend every single meeting, not saying that that's implied in our document, but that shouldn't have to be the case. And I feel like there should be, I feel like it shouldn't be assumed that the one chairperson should have to be doing all of those things. And maybe like how Mike had mentioned, keep it more ambiguous or up to interpretation instead of assuming that that one person would be taking on all of that responsibility um, because they do share equal amounts of power with any other council person, so. Thank you, Stephanie, uh, Gabe, then Taylor. I saw your hand. Awesome. OK, y'all. So two things. One, with the chair thing, you know, for me, it isn't that much about, you know, like the power thing and stuff, because, you know, there's that clause saying, you know, that it's still a shared amount of power. For me, it's also the same thing as James with burnout. You know, that's something I'm just like worried about is that, you know, one person as the chair and stuff, who has all these responsibilities and then has school and stuff. You know, every individual, of course, knows themselves and like all that stuff. But like, 
we don't know what's going to happen, you know, and it's always good to have like, just like a little like backup type of thing. You know, that's why I think like having two chairs is helpful because they can just kind of bounce ideas off each other and, you know, help each other with like that burnout or something, you know? And then in addition, um, when it comes to Robert's rules of order, yes, I also, like, I, mm, I, I, there's good in it, there's bad in it. You know, there's good and bad in like everything and stuff. But like, sh- instead, couldn't we just change it to be like, hey, each council gets to decide whether or not they want to use Robert's rules of order, you know? Can it just be like, it's up to the council to just decide whether or not to use it? And if so, then that's on them. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike, and then Chad. So um, I'm just want to make a friendly amendment motion. Um, I just, in the spirit of just kind of keep this ambiguous and up to the discretion of the two people kind of elected to these positions. Um, so where I would make this amendment is where within a council there will be an election. I'm going to just change or elected. Um, I'm going to change it to an election of either a co-chair or, or either a chair and vice chair or co-chair system um, up to the discretion of the two individuals kind of just elected. So that would be kind of my friendly amendment. Um, it could be definitely worded better, but that's just going to move down the spot. James, do you accept that as a friendly amendment, even yeah. though he didn't make it quite clear what he was going to say? <laughs> Mike, real quick, uh, we're talking about the election section two from article one. Yes. Uh, can you just repeat one more time? Just well, this is actually in section one, I believe. Yeah, so the structure. Art- structure, okay. Good. So we would change the, the, the word verbiage here to election of one chair per who, per semester facility at the meetings to um either so give the option so either a co-chair system or like a vice chair system yeah oh with the parentheses it could be either yeah i'm a math major not a word major so and so in the spirit of me trying to make sure this is a document we all agree on i'll accept it i want to know how you all feel about it well Mm-hmm. Go go ahead, Paul, but then I just have to clarify as well. I think that a constitution or any sort of governing document needs to be solid. It needs to be um, something that like an organization is bound by and the that they like, would carry it out. And that's why I was really concerned about reflecting accurately the like the power dynamics and stuff. But also I think that, you know, to make it and ambi- like the next council has the option. To, to do whatever they'd like in that uh, in that leadership role, like they could they could amend this document and have four co-chairs if they want, right? Um, nothing's going to stop them from that. But the, the the document does become weaker the more things that are optional and the more things that are like, hey, maybe maybe in 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 principle we do this, but in actuality we do something different. It's like earlier in the year when we were talking about passing a resolution in principle, everything that we agree on action wise, especially our governing documents should be something that, you know, is in principle and in action aligned and not something that is like, well, maybe in a certain condition at a certain time, certain place. And so I'm definitely willing to be moved on the whole chair co-chair thing, but I do think that it should be like, you know, it, it should say precisely. And I'm, a, I'm opposed to the ambiguous, the, amb- the ambiguousness of it. It needs to be more solid. Yes, you did. Sorry. Um, so as far as Robert's rules of order, I think it can stay in. And then, like Paul was just saying, it, it can be an amendment for the next council should they decide to utilize something different. But this would always be something that they could fall back on and have a structured meeting. Um, as far as the chairs, co-chairs situation, um, I I don't see an issue with either one of them. However, the situation that we have right now as far as co-chairs, it sounds like there just needs to be more communication between the two chairs or two co-chairs and separate the responsibilities. Whether it's, okay, you will facilitate every meeting, then that is something that that one of the chairs will focus on entirely. And the other chair does not have to worry about unless the other chair is gone. And then uh, president's cabinet meeting, same thing. Y'all are already sharing the workload. Um, and uh, the the responsibilities and the the need for help has been voiced from the chairs with these present cabinet meeting and things like that of asking for talking points from the, the council at large. So that way you all don't have to do it entirely yourself. 
So it, it, it is a, a, I think it is a conversation that needs to be had of, is this out of necessity or is this out of um, just discomfort? And Go ahead. And I had to make a point of order motion. Um, was my amendment, so I made a motion earlier. Was that accepted by you, James? We're Did discussing we, it for James. Oh, so now we're just, it's on that discussion. He's not willing to accept it on his own. He wants it to be a council collective decision. So we're discussing it further. Those are your words, James, right? That was James's <laughs> words. Not Dan speaking for James. Can we vote on accepting that amendment? Let me speak up a little bit. Go ahead. Okay. I think what it comes to chairs, let's just go ahead and do what Stephanie says. Paul, I completely understand what you mean, but I also know that in the spirit of things, people are feeling more comfortable with what Mike is also saying is having it be optional. So I will pretty much keep the same language, except for I will add, you know, the parentheses asked at the end of it. And then if we need to, I can drop an amendment that, you know, describes more of like how chair system works. So that way we can let, you know, future counselors know, like if you want, to have one or two chairs. I don't know if they would do three chairs. That's completely up to them. But we can limit it down to just two and allow you know future councils to decide. Because I think cementing it right now is too difficult for us to decide. So allowing us to be optional and allowing the next council to be optional is the best bet. Thank you. Just really quick on it. I'm not certain. I support the, there being a chair. Um, and a vice chair, but that, that's because I don't think there's enough work for co-chairs or, or definitely certainly not three chairs, but also to speak on it, um, we do communicate. We do co communicate fine and we're and and we able to, you know, get the things done. I'm also able, appreciate that I'm able to um, ask other counselors to do things as well, um, which helps out a lot because obviously um, it's all of us. So I just wanted to speak on that. Paul, go ahead. I just wanted to direct a response and also it reminded me of something Stephanie had said as well. Just this notion that like the reason I, had like the first, the, the only reason, well, you get your hand up over there. We'll get, make sure we get to you. Um, the, the real reason like motivating me to do this um, isn't because it's hard for me, isn't because it's uncomfortable for me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm in the executive leadership of like four different orgs and, and then some, you know, working with some others. So I'm not burnt out, right? I'll tell you when I'm burnt out um, and when things are too hard or anything like that. Right. I, and I think that um, really I'm it is on the efficacy. How well can the job of a chair be done if we split it between two people whose brains, as well as we might communicate, Dan and I, because we really do. We talk every day, you know, on the weekends even. And, um, you know, we're still two separate brains trying to do what one brain could really do a lot better. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to push back a little bit on the like. I'm not doing this because it's hard or because I'm lazy. You know, I'm I'm crazy busy out here, um, but I'm still doing my you know my end of the co-chair work. It's just um, it's just a matter of like, hey, would it be better if we just had one person dedicated to this work? Then James, and then yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I. Want to touch back on okay so like on the applications you know of this um if we do vote on this um and it says you know just it with what it is with like the chairs and stuff how is that going to affect us now and also robert's rules of order because you know if we vote on like if this comes in then that means that we're going to start following robert's rules of order probably like you know right after and so thinking about about do we one as a council us want to use Robert's rules of order um you know in in us right now because we can talk about the future and what's gonna happen in the future but what's gonna happen now too you know so like do we as a council right now want to use Robert's rules of order mm -hmm. um and two if so is there gonna be like a crash course on this because that book 600 pages and we're like almost done with the semester and like I have finals we have to study you know we have things to do and so you know just thinking of how will this affect us also right now? We actually are implementing Robert's Rules of Orders just when it comes to calling when we speak mm -hmm. and all of that. I don't think I, I would just refer you to CR 221. Thank you. Very first resolution we passed to just affirmed it, mm -hmm. uh, and it was one that enjoyed, um, I think, unanimous support, if not like one vote away from being unanimous. And it was specifically saying um, and it's worth revisiting 
that the council will use Robert's Rules of Order and that we will make an effort, all counselors will make an effort to learn Robert's Rules of Order. And that's something people voted on and agreed on as a body that we posted and published on our SharePoint. I wasn't done. Gabe. Okay, thank you. Um, and so within like that Robert's Rules of Order and stuff, also like each thing's there could be different for people to understand, you know? like different ways that they could perceive something. And so just thinking about like, okay, like how are we going to like look at like the different sections and stuff? And then like who, and then that just brings into the question of like, so then uh, will, if the chairs are using you know, like Robert Rules of Order and stuff, um, how does that stop like from other people like wanting to take over the meeting without, you know? You can answer that directly. Because moving mm -hmm. right. So the, one of the things you can do in Robert's Rules of Order um, to like essentially rein in something that like gets out of control is to lay a motion on the table, right? Like for example, if we wanted to, you know, lay this constitution on the table and pursue it at a later date, uh, we could do just that if we feared that it would take the rest, like the rest of the time we had. Or worst, worst, worst case scenario, somebody comes in here, I'll, you know, I'd like to, um, you know, uh, like if, if if I, for example, wanted to specifically like tank our work here and make sure that we didn't do anything, um, we'd be able to combat that with elements like laying some laying a motion on the table. There's more to it as well. Um, there's just a, there's a ton in there that's useful. There's a ton that we don't use, and there's a ton that we honestly, um, for the sake of um, of of working with people and understanding that everyone's new to this, um, that we go a little easy on. Right, like I'm not up here, the Roberts Rules Nazi. Like the moment someone's like out of order, out of order, right? Um, but yeah, but it there is some useful stuff in there, like laying on the table. Taylor, um, I motion that we vote on Mike's amendment to have it say chairs. No chair parentheses s. I second that. Good. So the chair recognizes Taylor's motion to vote on Mike's language that says chair parentheses s parentheses and the chair recognizes James's second. All right. Discussion. Uh, move to discussion if there's no uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Move to discussion. Is anyone opposed to that? Paul. I'm opposed for the reasons I stated earlier. I really do think the chair vice chair um, model will, will work a lot better. Um, and that's informed by my my practice as a chair on this on this council, uh, informing that direction. Discussion. See if anyone wants to speak on it. Further discussion. So before we do that, we need to call the question, right? And so calling the question ends discussion. Um, is there any further discussion on this? Anyone else want to say anything? Okay. We do this though so that we're practicing a democratic process. Now, you call in the question? Can we already call the question? No, we, we have voted. Called the we're, question. We're, we're, I call the question. All right. So, so moved. It's not so moved. So we have a second. All right. Um, is anyone opposed to ending discussion? Hearing none. I know this is tedious, but this is literally how we protect like the minority voice in this process, right? Um, yawn if you want, but this is important. Um, all right, calling the question. Which means we're going to vote on this amendment on the amendment on the amendment to the language in there before we were not voting on the Constitution or implementing it. OK, Alex. Abstain. Dad. Yes. Gabe. Yes. James. Aye. Mike. Yes. Naomi. Yes. Paul. No. Um, I. Stephanie. 
Yes. Taylor. Yes. I vote no. So let's count this. Um, all right, so the amendment passed. But now the conversation, the discussion is is around the a new amended language in that section of the document. Um, Chad, do you have something? I do. Um, in Article 1, Section 1, I'm just now realizing that um, based on the verbiage, it seems like um, during general elections, individuals will have to run for chair or co-chair, and it does not state how the chair or co-chair system will be voted upon. And for that reason, I would like to table this till next week. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Is there a second? Back in. Second. Okay, enthusiastic second. Okay. So, so we are now calling to question. What is anybody opposed to that? Okay. So then, this is the tabling of. We table then that. Um, oh, we have to call. Yeah. Well, okay. We call the question. Yeah, we're calling to question the motion to table the discussion on the whole constitution, as I understand it. The whole constitution. Okay. That's the motion. Good. I just want to make sure the motion maker agrees. Now um, it's been seconded. The motion's on the floor. Is anyone opposed to tabling this until um, do we have a time? Maybe Chad next week. I said next week. Yes. Next week. OK, cool. Sorry to miss that. Uh, so until next week, anyone opposed? All right, hearing none. And so uh, motion passes. Uh, this will be ta this will be tabled. Or rather, the motion's tabled, I guess is a better way to put it, um, until next week, and we'll circle back on that. Okay. Thank you. Chad, the floor is yours. All right, I'm going to make this super quick. Um, we have a couple items that we need to discuss as far as elections go. We passed the Pokemon Go to, co go to the polls that allocated $2,000 of our budget to be utilized for um, for elections, and that is specifically, uh, it has goals outlined and it's specifically for the fall um, fall semester for the elections managers to create an elections manual um, that will from here forward be how elections are are util are, are done. Um, so uh, basically, so I I'm going to make a motion that we uh, we have two managers both hired at the rate of eighteen dollars per hour. Um, this motion is also going to allow us to actually start the hiring process, and uh, yeah. that is my motion for for two. Starting as soon as it passes, or as soon as starting as soon as we hire, and which uh, I believe we have to um, advertise the position for a certain amount of time, and then do the hiring, and then from then they will be official um, employees. So this is the this is just to create the positions two of them at eighteen an hour. Correct. Okay. Second. Is there a second on that? Oh, wait, Taylor, do you have something? Get that in discussion if you're willing to hold it. What? We can get that in discussion if you're willing to hold it. Just like two seconds. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. Anyone second? You can second. We get into discussion. I second. All righty. Into discussion we go. All right. Okay. Um. There was discussion of them hiring an underclassman, correct? Like to be on their team to learn how the process works. Are we going correct? To do that that was that was an individual who mm -hmm. has expressed um, interest in wanting to uh, to be the elections manager again. However, I have no idea if that individual will be hired. Right. But, so okay. Uh, right I just now, like that idea. I, I totally agree with the idea that is also going to be a spring item so that okay. they can help with uh, elections themselves. And so if that is something that our elections managers want to do, um, then they can bring it to the council and request that. Okay. Thanks for the clarity. Yes. Appreciate it. Mike. And just to make sure. So we're going to hire them. Um, is a lot. So this $2,000 we've allocated, which is what they're going to be paid out of. Um, is that going to be, are they going to use kind of that money and build us an elections manual, taking pieces of last year, taking pieces of what we, we, year, we did years ago, kind of just make us the elections manual? The construction of the, of the elections manual will be at the total discretion of 
the elections managers and then will have to be voted upon by the council. However, they piecemeal the, the information or construct it entirely new is entirely up to them. Stephanie. Yeah, so the elections manual um, isn't really changed um, just because I can't remember the official name of it, but um, people from outside of the university kind of come in and they work on it with the elections people. And it's like a big old process, but the election manual has kind of stayed the same since 2019, I believe, which is normal as far as I'm concerned. So there wouldn't really be a reason to change it other than like minor inconsistencies with like the name, but it's usually not changed. As far as I understand, the elections that happened in 2019 were different than the elections that brought us in to, uh, to office because it utilized ranked choice voting. And if that is something that we want to continue, then a different elections manual will have to be constructed. Oh, shoot. OK, um, so is so what are we anticipating? How many hours a week are we anticipating that we would like to hire what, that the ad's going to say that we're hiring two individuals for? Do we know? I personally think that this should be a remote uh, position 10 hours a week for the fall. And then during the spring when they're working on uh, um, elections and events and things like that, like real like nitty gritty, then um, we can re reassess if they remain remote or if they do part time in in person or how that looks. OK, and then Mike, oh, go ahead. For HR purposes, I have it here is works up to 15 hours a week. Now, remote or not, that's up for our discretion to decide. That doesn't have to be listed on the, the job description, but also. Um, in full transparency, with this going up now, HR is reworking their whole system, switching from whatever it is now to Workday, which is the HR system. There's a very real chance this person might not even get in until the beginning of January, once the EPAFs and HR clears all their things, as we saw with Kenny's issues. So just putting that out there. And then this Mike, when we were talking about the budget, when you bud, uh, budgeted for the two versus not, does that fall in line with like which one, the high, the medium, or the low when it comes to the projected? So versus we, at fifteen an hour per person, so that's thirty an hour. Thir or, I mean, thirty eighteen an hour. Excuse me, thirty hours a week. So um, my projections and my computer just died, or I said share them. Um, so my projections, this money that we're going to use. To get them hired at the moment is just has already been passed. It's been allocated over there. It's two grand. My new budget budget projections are for starting in um, the spring. So um, this would fall underneath the so ten hours a week would fall under the low category of um, that funding. Okay, so then initially this is going to the first initial pay is going to be covered under that two thousand that was passed yes. initially. Okay, just trying. Once to that pay runs out, then we'll actually have to vote on the full package of what we want to pay them. Yeah, but then at the rate that HR is going, it may be until January. Yes. Get so okay, just trying to put the picture together. Okay. And if that is the case, then then we just kind of then I adjust my numbers and we add that two grand that was originally cast aside for them into the budget. We have more money to spend on elections. Okay. All. Here. Do we have an estimate for like the cost of these, like the total cost? For so this, cost this election? like this motion, right? The motion oh. we're talking about, the motion to bring on two, you know, eighteen an hour, like employees. Um, I know we've talked about like projections and stuff like that in the past, but I'm just curious if we have like a solid number and estimate on how much it'll cost. Um, do you mind? So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Do you mind rephrasing that again? So the, the motion that um, you've you've made, Chad, I'm just curious how much it'll cost, like out of our budget, um, just to, just a rough estimate. So there, this pay would come out of the Pokemon Go's full act, which is the two thousand dollars that has already been allocated in our budget. So I understand we 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 did that to get it rolling, 
Um, oh, I see a hand over here. My bad. Gabe. Okay. Hi, y'all. Uh, so real quick, great discussion and everything. I just want to remind people, we have nine minutes left in our meeting, and we still have to get to Taylor's thing, Naomi's thing, and finish with this. So just like a little heads up, we have nine minutes left. Um, little, little, you know, little time check because, yeah. So I understand the first portion would come out of that 2000 put into the Pokemon Go, but it will exceed that. We anticipate that it will exceed that, right? Yes, as we're as Mike said earlier, the Pokemon Go's the poll is just to get the ball rolling, create the elections manual for the fall semester, and then we will continue to work on the uh, the spring semester, the what that entire budget looks like, and uh, what we'd have to vote on it later at a later date. Those are my Taylor. Um, I just wanted to say that we can uh, table the thing that I brought to the agenda for this week since I have to get going pretty soon. Me and Alex have our meeting with ASCP at 430. Yeah, Naomi left too. OK. Um, I motion to vote for chat yeah, form. All right. Yeah. You motion. The chair recognizes a motion to vote on Chad's resolution. Or I second. You, you second your own. OK. Not that it matters. All right. So let's bring that to call the question. So are we going to open that up for discussion? I hate to be that guy, but we should do that with everything unless we close discussion. Well, sure. Let's open it up for discussion. Does anybody have any discussion? Yeah. I, I I just think it seems to me like there's a lot of details that we that we could iron out with this and maybe maybe propose in a written form. Um, but I, you know, I'm with the idea. I'm not necessarily saying that we should go chintzy on the elections like the elections deserves our support and everything like that. I just I want to know the details of what it, how, it, how it's all going to how the numbers are going to pan out, you know, um, so I'm a, I'm a little opposed. OK, well, that's just my. Discussion. If you're Does anyone who want to respond to that? I do know that we are. Yeah, we are getting to the end of the meeting. Um, I personally would like to see the numbers laid out too, uh, but I also do support elections. Um, but is there a motion? Uh, call the question. Call the question. Or something. I call the, the question. Discussion. It wasn't seconded. We called it, and then we had discussion, and then. Now let's get happening. let's not let this turn into some sort of animal circus, right? Let's I call the question down for two seconds. Second the question. It contains some of our frustration, right? We have members of the press here, for example. Um, so let's just call the question. Bring it down a little bit. Okay, so it's been called the question. Here goes Alex. Uh, I, I. Chad. Hi. Gabe. Hi. James. Hi. Mike. Hi. Paul. No. Bree. Hi. Stephanie. Um, Taylor, not here. I abstain. Stephanie. Yes. Motion passes. We can table that to next week if we need more time. Motion is table. 
withdraw my request and we can just do it next week. There is a document, just so everybody's aware, there is a document that we can request items to the agenda that it's in the chat that Kenny so kindly put in that we can get in. If we can get that by 5 p.m. on Wednesday evening, we won't have to do this amending of the agenda at the meeting and then people getting kicked off um, because we're going too long. So I would have really appreciate it, as would Kenny, that we get that on the agenda by or in that document by 5 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. I would just motion that we move to public comment. I second that. Is anyone opposed? OK, so if you're here from the public, that wasn't much time, but if you're here from the public, please put your name in the in the in the chat and, and have the floor. That's OK. Just here. OK, uh, awesome. So no public comment. That is fantastic, um, although I encourage members of the public to speak at any point. Um, all right, so we'll move. Unless anyone's opposed, we'll move to. Uh, Adjourn the meeting. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone.